By this time, the necromancer had fallen in with his current companions, the rogue and the barbarian I've mentioned before. They'd spent maybe a year or so, perhaps less, adventuring together by this point. They had formed deep bonds of friendship during their travels and travails. But the necromancer was understandably worried that they would not fully appreciate the value of his experiment, which is to say that they might deem him mad or monstrous and turn on him. So he concocted an odd tale about having heard rumours of an orc farm, which was sort of true, he had heard a rumour about an entirely unrelated tribe of farming orcs, and insisted they go to investigate. The barbarian and most especially the rogue were understandably suspicious, as they were not idiots and furthermore knew by this time that the necromancer had numerous secrets and schemes wherever they went. But they went along with it anyway. They embarked on a journey to a certain remote village, each in his way wondering what they would find. Right away, they could tell that something wasn't quite right. As they approached the outskirts of the village, they saw that the land appeared to have been erratically turned as by some mad team of ploughmen. The earth was dust and dry in some places and swampy in others. Sickly plants grew here and there and more rarely healthy ones could be seen. Closer into the town they found things were a bit more orderly and the crops more successful. But the plants seemed stressed and the people they saw looked weary and downcast. They decided against bothering any of the workers before they got to the town proper. Upon reaching the town they noticed that there were orcs going about in daylight. At first they couldn't tell they were orcs for they wore large hats that covered their faces or else less commonly hoods. They decided not to bother any of those surely upstanding citizens. Instead, they made their way to the local tavern and set about learning what they could about the bizarre little town. The necromancer naturally kept his face hidden. His companions did not particularly take note of this as it was relatively common practice for him to do so. The townsfolk were reluctant to speak to the adventurers, at first insisting that nothing was wrong. When they managed to get one of them somewhere more private, however, he glanced around nervously before recalling the story. He told them that the town long had troubles with the Yorks that lived in the hills, having to endure occasional raids and attacks on the road, but it seemed that a couple of years back, weird things had started happening. A raiding party of Orcs had tried to storm the town gates once, making a great racket while doing so. Naturally, they had driven them off with arrow fire. They had thought that would be the end of it, but the next day, they had seen the raiders approach again, this time in broad daylight, even when they began firing at them. The orcs continued approaching, shouting as they did so. It took a bit of doing to drive them off at that time, but they kept at it and eventually managed to get rid of them. A couple of days later, a single orc approached bearing an enormous shield, which made him frustratingly difficult to kill. When he got close, they could hear him shouting about peace and wanting to be friends. They looked around, but did not see any other orcs. They took some time and debated what to do. While they did so, then the men on the walls reported that the orc had thrown something at them. They had returned fire, but had not managed to kill the orc. A bit of searching revealed a strange stone, which on closer inspection revealed to be a semi-precious gem. They weren't sure what was going on, but they knew that they didn't much like it. They weren't sure what this orc's game was, but they weren't about to let it sucker them. They dispatched militiamen armed with simple spears to go kill the orc, which they did. Bizarrely, the orc was unarmed, Though an inspection of the body revealed that it was carrying a number of small semi-precious gems and a fair amount of coinage, these spoils were distributed to the men of the militia as fairly as possible, and they redoubled their vigilance. That was the last they saw of the orcs for a bit. A couple of weeks passed with no orc sighting and things slowly went back to normal. For days, folks talked about the strange events and what they might pretend. A few who had heard of what happened said that it didn't seem right for them just to kill the unarmed orc like that. But those who'd lost close family and friends to orc raids were quick to point out that orcs had no such qualms about killing unarmed humans and that it was a bit better to have a dead orc and a safe town that was a bit richer than let an orc in and risk everyone's safety. In time the talk died down and folks went back to their lives as usual. They had driven off the orcs and would do so again if they returned as they always had. When the attack came though, they found that they weren't as well prepared as they had thought. No one was quite sure how they'd come up on them so quick without anyone noticing. Usually they came up screaming and bellowing and swinging their weapons, killing whomever they could, but not pursuing those who managed to get away very far. They only rarely came near the town proper, 
for they knew that the town had walls and archers and there wasn't all that much to be gained. They'd heard that in the north, where orcs were more plentiful, they periodically poured out of the mountains in a great horde and destroyed everything in their wake. They'd heard that at such times they often used surprisingly sophisticated techniques, but they never thought that such a thing could happen here. The orcs hereabouts were simple raiders. That night though, everything was different. The orcs had come in greater numbers, employed more advanced tactics than the townsfolk had thought them capable of. Even deployment of such simple technology as ladders took them totally by surprise. They knew the orcs could forge weaponry, but somehow they had always fancied that they spent all of their time when they weren't terrorising humans, squatting in caves doing nothing of any particular use. The idea that they might be able to outthink them had never entered their minds. It was horrible. The orcs poured into the village, killing some and catching others in great nets. They were strong and fast and savage and nothing could stop them. Worst of all though, was their leader. He was a great orc, powerful and clad in heavy armour. On his head he wore a helmet of shining darkness. He struck down all who stood against him with his mighty strength and commanded the orcs with speed and confidence, instantly responding to whatever desperate defence they tried to mount. Soon, everyone in the town had either fled or been captured or killed. They were sure that they would all be killed or eaten or something somehow worse. For hours they were held captive, herded into the largest buildings in the town. They were told, in common, which a month ago they had no notion orcs could speak, to be silent until they were told otherwise. They were examined and counted. Orcs could count, but not harmed. In that time, there were a few attempts to escape, which were uniformly dealt with harshly, though usually not lethally. They were kept together. What purpose, no one knew, for what felt like forever. At last, though, they were all forced out into the centre of town. The terrifying king of the orcs came before them and calmly addressed the assembled townsfolk. He told them that he regretted that this conquest had been necessary, but he had been left with no choice. It had been decided that man and orc would be friends, and he would not tolerate any other outcome. Three times he had sent his envoys of friendship, and three times they had been met with violence. He would tolerate no more. He would have friendship at any price. <laughs> Me trying to make friendship. <laughs> be my friend now! <laughs> He forbid the town folk to try and leave the town, to ensure that the more fragile humans were not damaged in escape attempts. Women and children would be held for their own protection in the underground cellars that the orcs would shortly begin constructing. Those that had already fled would be dealt with, and returned if possible. In subsequent days, he announced that he and many of the occupying orcs would be returning to their home, but that a permanent force, a friendship force, <laughs> would be established to administer things in the town. The new friends would be taught the arts of farm craft. Naturally, the townsfolk would have to supply the farming axes and earth swords, and whatever else it was that was required to do farming, until such a time as new ones could be crafted. Naturally, they would be fairly compensated for this loss. In time, the number of orcs in town was reduced, just as the king had said, but the friendship force had occupied the town ever since. They had turned out to be rather poor farmers. They spoiled the land over tilling by the soil or improperly irrigating. They had very little patience, often accusing the farmers of trying to trick them when the immediate results were not yielded and often undertook unwise actions when frustrated. Initially, some of them seemed to be under the impression that farming was a matter of beating the earth until it yielded up its spoils. One was heard to remark, what's wrong? I'm hitting it as hard as I can. <laughs> Looks like meat's back on the, the menu, menu boys! <laughs> the compensation for the farming equipment and seed and livestock necessary to get the orcs started on their venture, and for the food necessary to keep the occupying orcs fed, which the king was kind enough to offer when it became clear that the farming was going to take longer and yield less than had been anticipated, was largely worthless. It was either precious stones or metals that they couldn't spend because they could no longer go to the market in a city old orcish artifacts that were of little value even if they could be sold, and things that were actively harmful, like live wolves to protect the farmer's livestock. The only thing of any value that the orcs provided were regular shipments of food and lumber, both harvested from the forest hills near the orcs' warren. Even these, though, were mostly taken up by the orcs' own need. The man the party interviewed 
had little insight into what had led the orcs on this sudden, mad course. He knew that the king had commanded them to do so, but they all acted like it was some sort of desperate mission rather than the pure insanity that it obviously was. He gathered that it was part of their dark, orky religion, for they often talked about secret happenings and hushed tones in their own language. But what god could have led them to such madness he didn't dare imagine. Now though, a grip of adventurers had arrived and surely their troubles would be soon over, for as everyone knew, there was nothing that adventurers liked to do so much as save beleaguering towns from marauding orcs. He could scarcely contain his excitement at the prospect that the long nightmare was finally over. Fortunately, the rogue managed to calm him down and get him to keep his mouth shut for the time being, lest he endanger the mission. The barbarian and rogue were confused to say the least. They couldn't imagine what could possibly be going on, but they, particularly the rogue, knew that the necromancer was somehow involved. The necromancer, for his part, said nothing, though he did a piss poor job of hiding that something was on his mind. The group didn't really have anywhere they felt comfortable talking about it for the fear of being lynched by all parties involved, so they simply resolved to find this orc warren in the hills when they had a chance, assuming they were allowed to leave the town. It turned out not to be all that difficult to get out of the town. Have little delays because, hey, it wasn't their loved ones who was being held hostage. They managed to create a suitable distraction and simply quietly left the town when the resident orcs weren't looking. The barbarians set about searching for signs of the passage of orcs to lead them to the orc stronghold, which turned out to be just a well since the necromancer had more or less forgotten how precisely to get there, and soon they were on their way. On the way, while the barbarian was searching for sign and for danger, the rogue began needling the necromancer. He mentioned that all this was a rather strange situation. The necromancer conceded that it wasn't quite what he had anticipated either. The rogue continued that it was rather miraculous that the necromancer had happened to hear that there were farming orcs in this area, considering that they had no contact with the outside world. To which the necromancer responded that he actually travelled to this area once in the past, and, pray tell, had compelled him to return on this particular occasion the rogue wandered. The necromancer responded, rather non-committedly, and with more than a bit of non-sequitur, that he had failed to anticipate this particular outcome. Presently the truth came out. The necromancer, slightly sheepishly, confessed his experiments to the rest of the party. The looks on the players' faces were priceless. <laughs> I I know. In time, they arrived at the orc's lair, where they were greeted with great honours. The necromancer was hailed as the prophet, and his companions introduced themselves as the profiteers, which is a pretty apt description of them most of the time. While the necromancer received a status update from the orcs, the other party members were shown around the orcs' caves. They heard the story of how the prophet had descended upon the clan with his terrible elf hound. They were told of how he had brought with him the cutting times to test the endurance of the tribe, and had chosen their king for greatness. They learned of the commandments of friendship and farming, and how they had scrumptiously followed them in the Prophet's absence, lest he bring about a return to the cutting times, an event that the tribe might not survive a second time. The necromancer, for his part, learned that his surgery had indeed worked. The orcs who had shown signs of enhanced intellect had generally performed quite well, often rising to positions of leadership within their rest respective fields, or else advising those who had, so much so that it had become the fashion amongst the tribe to ritually scar the heads of young orcs as they came of age in hopes of imbuing them with greatness. But the increased intelligence of some had not spared the tribe its troubles. They still lacked the skills that the humans had won through the years, usually generations of work. They were still, one the whole, cruel and foul-tempered. They did not generally respect the conquered humans, though it quickly became clear that the king had a kind of respect for them and so were often loath to heed in their advice. And though their mission may have been to master farming, they had no love of it. Even as they plied and planted and watered, they could not but yearn for the thrill of battle. He further learned that they had been very fortunate these past years, in that no rival orc tribe had discovered the true extent of their weakened state. The king feared that, should their activities ever become clear to the other orcs who populated the hills, both orc and man might fall to their attacks. They spent a good bit of time amongst the orcs, 
learning their ways and teaching them where they could. They taught them advanced tactics and fighting techniques and began improving their defences in preparation for potential raids. The barbarian taught their smith ancient secrets of forging metal that had been imparted to him in distant lands. The necromancer began drawing up plans for magic items designed to improve the life of the orc and men. The rogue even explored the orc's religion and had a mystical experience deep within the caves. At last, they decided to see if they could find some way to somehow salvage this situation. They set out on a quest to locate someone who might help bring out the genuine peace between the two races and allow them to find some sort of happiness. The quest began in the nearest large town, where they purchased large amounts of food and other necessary items and had them sent up to the troubled village, with instructions to continue on their way as soon as possible. This town happened to have a temple to the goddess of agriculture. The group hadn't paid much attention to it when they'd passed through in the past, but it was now highly relevant to their interest. They entered the temple. Well, the rogue and the barbarian did. The necromancer stood outside across the street, sulking about and eating fruit he purchased from a local fruit vendor whose stall happened to be set up just there. And thanks to the rogue's charm and diplomatic ability, managed to secure an audience with the chief priestess. They asked, as directly as they could, whether there was anyone she knew of who might be able to help teach farming techniques to a band of orcs who had captured a human village in a misguided but earnest attempt to meet the frankly insane demands their crazed necromancer tormentor. Hypothetically, of course. She saw pretty quickly that they were probably not wholly innocent in this affair, but saw also that their desire to help was genuine, and so decided to tell them what they wanted to know. She informed them that they might find an individual who may be able to handle the scenario they had described in a tiny halfling village located some distance to the north. Well, they were able to get to the little halfling village with very little trouble. It was more or less what you'd imagine. Nice, gentle, rolling hills, suitable for halflings to build their burrows in. Fields of cute, fluffy sheep, minded by tiny shepherds with little crooks and gigantic, but friendly looking dogs giving away picturesque plots of crops and quaint little gardens strewn all about. Neat, straight fences and brightly painted doors, that sort of thing. They rode up, located what appeared to be a rather inviting tavern, or would have been if it had not have been built in miniature, and hitched their horses to a post that was entirely too low to the ground and found themselves greeted by a rotund, smiling little gentleman who introduced himself as the local sheriff. Patting the well taken care of, apparently seldom used, short sword that hung on his hip. They conversed with him for a bit. He welcomed them to the sleepy little town and asking if there was anything he could do to assist them. They complimented the fine respectable community and eventually asking after the location of the man they sought. The sheriff cheerfully informed them that the fellow could be found from time to time tending the gardens around the shrine to the halfling gods that lay just up the road away. He said that he didn't suppose he would be there now, but if they cared to wait for a bit in the tavern, he would be there in due time. He even gave them a few coins for a drink. Now the rogue, ever suspicious and more familiar with halflings and their ways than he usually let on, decided to take a look at the coins that he had been given just in case the little folk were trying to put one over on them. Sure enough, they were marked on the edge in such a way that a casual observer wouldn't be likely to notice and wouldn't likely invalidate the coin with people who cared about such things. What it might mean though, he had no idea, so he decided to just go ahead and play along for the time being. The tavern was just the sort of pleasant little place that any respectable halfling farm would be happy to go in to put up his hairy feet and socialise with his fellows over a pipe of smokeweed and a pint of nice dark stout after a day of tending his plants. It was, of course, built entirely too small. Even the smallest of them, the rogue, had to hunch. And the barbarian and the necromancer, who was nearly as tall, felt as though they were bent almost double. The chairs were built so low that the men's knees were positioned halfway to their chests and their legs would not have fit under the tables even had that not been the case. It was highly pleasant for all though. A little investigation and asking of some canny questions presently revealed that there was more going on in this sleepy little hamlet than there had initially seemed. The rogue, 
experienced in subtle forms of communication, was able to convince the folk in the tavern that he and his comrades were worthy candidates to be let in on the goings-on hereabouts, hinting that he already knew far more than he actually did. After some initial suspicion and nervous eyeing of the barbarian, and especially the necromancer, the rogue assured them that they were cool. The party was shortly directed to the back room, which had a concealed, though not so well concealed as it had once been. It had seen long and heavy use. Hatch in the door. They opened it and climbed down the ladder. It revealed, to their surprise, they discovered that there was what amounted to a second, larger tavern. This one, thankfully, had a higher ceiling, though the barbarian and wizard still had to mind the hanging lanterns. A lightly armoured halfling stopped them and offered to relieve them of their weapons, which they allowed, though the rogue kept most of his numerous hidden daggers. The tavern was more richly appointed than the one above, but remained tasteful. Everything smelled rather of pipe smoke, but it was tolerable. All about them were small tables. Some were similar to those above, albeit with different tablecloths, but others were clearly designed for the purpose of gambling. Few of them were in use. In the corner, in a sort of booth designed for privacy and guarded by some, relatively, burly halflings sat a rather obese and therefore successful halfling. One of the burly halflings confronted the party, but the large, elderly halfling motioned for him to be silent. He asked them in an odd, mumbly, strangely accented voice what had brought them to his establishment. It soon became clear that they had stumbled upon the headquarters of an organised crime operation. This secret borough served as a secondary tavern, safe house, gambling den and general hangout for members of this organisation as well as a shrine to the halfling god of, among other things, thievery. There was an odd sort of ceramic block with a halfling's footprint in it that they later saw visitors kneeling before and kissing. The rogue, sensing opportunity, began to talk up the party as potential assets to the organisation, always careful to show the utmost genuine respect and never to attempt to lie nor cheat in any important matters, knowing that he would be found out. The grandfather, as they later learned he was called, was impressed with the kid's moxie and decided to offer him an opportunity to win his respect. They talked for a while and ultimately the rogue, unable to offer any more tangible proof of his worth at the moment, staked his reputation on a game of dice, which he proceeded to win straight. We actually played the game out and luck was on his side. It was an extremely dramatic and ballsy thing to do but we were all on the edge of our seats when it came down to the final roll and let out a collective cheer when it came up a win. After receiving the grandfather's blessing, spirits were running high. The party enjoyed the room's goodwill and their congratulatory pints of stout, but they soon remembered why they had come to the town in the first place and headed back up to the shrine. There they found a lone, rugged halfling tending to the plants. They introduced themselves and inquired whether this fellow might be the man they sought. He regarded them with his one good eye. The other was covered by a dark eye patch and a rather ugly scar was visible peeking out from underneath it and replied that he was indeed the person that they had been seeking and what did they want. They explained the situation more or less completely to the halfling as he was bound to find out anyway and he conceded that they did seem to be in a bit of a pickle. There, but what did they want him to do about it? They returned that they had come highly recommended by the most reliable possible sources that they had happened upon in their entire week or so of searching, most of which was on the road between towns, as someone who could solve their problems for them. He in turn retorted that he was retired from that sort of business, and would they kindly buzz off. It was around that time that a pretty young human girl appeared, and asked what was going on. The halfling replied that it was nothing, just some kind of troublemakers, and he was just trying to get rid of them. So don't worry yourself about it. The girl was insistent, however as whatever it was they were talking about had sounded awfully important. The party agreed that it was their own business and that they would just have to find someone else to teach the orcs to farm. The girl, surprised, asked to know more. The halfling told her that it was a big folk business and nothing for them to get mixed up in. The girl, however, demanded that she be told about whatever it was that was going on, as she was now quite sure that it sounded important, adding that they knew all about farming. It was only a matter of time before the human girl, who was apparently the halfling's daughter somehow, was cheerfully telling the party that they'd be along presently. They just had to gather their things and say goodbye to everyone. They'd been living here for quite some time, so it might take a bit. The party, a bit confused, but nonetheless grateful, 
wandered away from the shrine, wondered amongst themselves what had just happened. They decided they didn't care all that much and just headed back to the grandfather's den so they could eat, drink and gamble while they waited. Before too awfully long, the scarred halfling fellow came along and rather gruffly told them that it was time to go, so they'd better hurry up before he changed his mind about the whole business. On the journey back to the Ork Town, they discussed the situation and what was to be done about it. The halfling expressed worries that the whole business was probably pointless at this point, but granted that he supposed they had to at least give it a shot and could always bug out if worse came to worse, adding that if anything should befall his daughter, he'd be coming for them. She, for her part, remained cheerfully, if cautiously, optimistic. When they arrived in the town's vicinity, they found it embroiled in an all-out battle, not between orcs and humans as they had feared, but between orcs, humans and enormous acid-spewing insect monsters, which the necromancer immediately identified as Ankegs. He'd actually had occasions to dissect one or two in his previous adventure, back in his days with that adventuring company. The crew immediately joined the battle and proceeded to kick ass. The bulk of the fighting was naturally done by the party. The halfling fellow quickly revealed himself to be quite a competent, if rather underhanded, fighter. Even the girl held her own with her short sword. Once the battle was over, the orcs, not about to let good meat and chitin go to waste, proceeded to prepare the ank eggs for rendering. While the dazed humans struggled to come to terms with the surprising fact that the orcs seemed to have just saved their lives, the halfling, not one to sit idly by, apparently took charge of the situation, demanding that the humans quit lazing about and get back to work. What kind of farmer sits in his ass and lets other do all the labour? The humans, still rather stunned by the whole ordeal, did as they were told to help the butcher the slain monstrosities. Somewhat to the necromancer's chagrin, he wanted to do it. It wasn't long before the halfling had, with the party's help, more or less taken charge of the whole town. They were in a tough spot. In fact, it was pretty terrible. None of them had asked for this, but here they were, for better or for worse, mostly worse. They were all in this together, and now there was nothing to do but buckle down and do what needed to be done, because doing what needs to be doing was what farmers do. It was a message that everyone could relate to, if not necessarily fully embrace, and it got things on track. The halfling surveyed the fields to see what needed to be changed and determined what, if anything, could be salvaged. He met with the Orc King and explained that, if this was going to work, he couldn't keep the humans working for him by force and managed to convince him to begin easing up on the restrictions that had been imposed upon the town folk. He also performed a survey of the hills that the Orcs had cleared around their caves and found that there would be a good area for growing grapes and hops. Since then, the party has checked in on the little village a few times and found that things were running pretty smoothly. All things considered, Tensions are still high, obviously, and they have a long and very difficult road ahead of them. But they have a few successes to their name. The orcs failed have become productive under the halfling's guidance. The orcs have proved better suited to growing grapes. It turns out orcs are good at picking and stomping things. And hops, which you literally just leave alone and pull down when it's time to harvest, than they were at the other crops. Allowing the orcs who lived in the caves to get in on the agriculture game. They now have very promising prospects for the production of alcohol, though their wines still need to age a bit. Finally, they have been breeding a unique breed of unusually large hog that looks like it might have a lot of potential. The raising of the hogs does present considerable trouble and even danger, as they have proven to be highly aggressive. However, for whatever reason, the orcs have proven highly adept at managing the foul-tempered swine. 